Hello, Hi. everyone. I'm Lindsay Joseph, the Senior Program Manager at Resolve to Save Lives, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's LINX webinar. For those of you who are new to the LINX programming, LINX is an, a growing online community and resource sharing platform for people working to improve cardiovascular health across the world. LINX was developed in collaboration between Resolve to Save Lives, the World Health Organization, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping rules. Today's presentations will be about 45 minutes long, followed by a Q&A session. We encourage participants to use the Q&A button and not the chat feature to ask questions. The Q&A button is located at the bottom of your screen. Participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but again, you have the option to type in your questions during the Q&A session of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the LINX website after the session. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Andrew Moran, Director of Global Hypertension Control Program at Resolve to Save Lives, to introduce today's topic and guest speakers. Thank you, Lindsay. So it's really a great pleasure today to um, host uh, the, the hypertension-oriented LINX webinar. And um, it looks like Lindsay is going to share the slides, that's very helpful. Um, so, so today's webinar is, is uh, not typical of our LINX webinars um, because it's focused on a, a high income country, the United States. Um, but uh, we thought that there are some instructive things going on in the United States as uh, with a lot of countries um, that can be lessons learned that can be applied in many of the settings uh, where you're working and to advance hypertension control. So as we know, uh, in terms of the uh, preventable causes of burden of disease, hypertension ranks the highest worldwide, and that's true in the United States as well. Next slide. And then at the global level, I think many of you on the webinar have seen this before, uh, we know that only one in seven of people living with hypertension, that's 1.4 billion people around the world, only one in seven have their um, hypertension uh, controlled. That's about 14%. And we're, so we're starting from a very low baseline and a lot of, of um, room for improvement. Now, turning our attention to the United States, uh, you can see that it's the, the proportion of people with controlled blood pressure is 43%, uh, that's considerably better, uh, but for a country uh, that invests a lot of resources in hypertension control and clinical care, um, it's really actually a disappointment. Um, and as a matter of fact, as you'll see in the slides to come um, uh, that will be presented, you're gonna see that in the United States, there have actually been some um, lost progress in terms of hypertension control over the last several years. Um, so the, yeah, this 43% can, uh, uh, translates to three in seven of people um, with hypertension controlled. And you can see along the, what we call the hypertension control cascade going from all people with uh, high blood pressure to those who are aware of their condition, to those who are uh, treated for the condition, and then the green bar, those who are controlled. There are, there are gaps and places where we can improve things on every step along the way of, the, of that cascade. Next slide. And at Resolve to Save Lives, along with our partners, we really emphasize a system-based approach to improving hypertension control. And we call this a, our hurdle slides. These are the barriers to improving hypertension control um, around the world. They're really the same lessons. Um, going from barriers related to diagnosis, to treatment, and to preserving continuity of care in patients already under treatment. And the one thing I always point out about this slide, if you look at the factors within those hurdles, there's only one low adherence to medications that really relates to a patient behavior. Every other barrier on this slide has to do with the healthcare system and how we deliver services. So we really can't blame patients for not controlling their blood pressure. We have to design the system around the patient to make it easy for them to control their blood pressure and pursue their treatment. For making it difficult for them, 
then we've already um, lost, uh, lost the battle. So, so our emphasis is on these system improvements that you see listed here. Next slide. And so how do we do that? How do we design the hypertension control program to make it easy for the patients and for the healthcare providers? Well, we follow the, the HEART's technical package that, that's um, promoted by the World Health Organization. And we know that in the next couple of months, perhaps next month or the month after, the World Health Organization is going to be releasing new hypertension treatment guidelines for the first time in decades. And it's really going to be um, a um, codification of this HEART's technical package in many ways. So what are the five components in this package? Well, one is a simple treatment protocol that any health worker can follow. Second is ensuring a reliable supply of quality assured antihypertensive medicines. The third component is team-based care involving non-physician health workers in the, in the care team. The fourth is patient-centered services. Again, delivering services near the patient's home and making it easy for them to take their medicines and pursue their treatment. And last is a robust health information system for measuring how the program is performing at the level of the individual patient, but also the entire um, facility and health system. And keep these in mind because these are part of the HEART's technical package that, that we are promoting in low and middle income countries around the world. But when you hear from um, our colleagues at the American Medical Association and from uh, Dr. Ogadegbe when he talks about community-based care, these, you're gonna see a lot of these components also apply in, in um, other country settings. Next slide. So I wanna take a moment to promote um, some of the materials and the tools that can help you with your hypertension control program and implementing those five components of hearts. Resolve to Save Lives just published what we call the six step guide for hypertension control program managers. Now it's appropriate for national or subnational hypertension programs. And it, it, um, along these six steps you see in the slide, when you go to the website and you see the link to the website at the bottom left, um, and we can put it in the chat as well. When you go to that website and you, you click, for example, on uh, the standard protocol step, that's step two, you'll see that there are available some, some uh, templates that you can adapt for your country and your setting. And there are also some country specific examples of all of these materials. So this is a toolkit and it's a resource for um, new programs and programs that are aiming to improve quality. So um, I encourage you to, to visit the site and, and start using the materials. And um, please, if you have materials that you've developed, we, we would love to uh, post them on this site as well. Next slide. So um, that's, that's just the uh, introduction from the perspective of Resolve and from the LINCS program. Um, and now um, I'm going to present a first of our speakers uh, Dr. Uh, Gregory Wozniak and Michael Rakots from the American Medical Association. Dr. Wozniak is a health economist and serves as the Director of Outcomes Analytics at the, at the AMA, where he leads a team of health economists and analysts supporting AMA quality improvement, program evaluation, and estimating potential cost savings from quality improvement intervent interventions. He currently serves as the AMA Principal Investigator on Funded Research from the National Association of Community Health Centers and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and holds the position of Adjunct Assistant Professor, General Internal Medicine in the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. Dr. Rakots serves as the Vice President of Health Outcomes at the AMA where he oversees efforts to develop and implement national quality improvement in initiatives aimed at improving blood pressure control and preventing cardiovascular disease. He is the AMA's clinical lead of the Target BP program, a nationwide multi-year intervention um, that's an initiative in collaboration with the American Heart Association to reduce the number of American adults living with uncontrolled hypertension. And so um, now I'll turn the presentation over to uh, Greg and Mike. 
Thank you, Andrew. Next slide. Uh, we have no uh, conflicts to report. Uh, next slide. So just quickly, um, here's the sort of agenda for uh, our presentation. Uh, a little bit about the current state of, of blood pressure control hypertension in the United States. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the MAP framework to set up uh, what our model looks like in terms of our logic model. And I'll walk through uh, some of the implementations that we have uh, carried out and the evaluations and what they've showed in terms of Im impacting blood pressure control. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Raycott to talk about where we are today in terms of dashboards, our virtual delivery, uh, and moving forward. Uh, next slide. So in terms of state of the uh, health uh, hypertension in the United States, uh, we'll touch on what control rates are, uh, what risk factors around blood pressure and hypertension, a little bit about the Surgeon General's call to action, our modeling in terms of improving blood pressure control. Uh, and again, looking at where we've been in terms of uh, past experience. Next slide. And sort of mimicking what Andrew mentioned around uh, risk factors in terms of um, in the US, uh, blood pressure control is a leading risk factor uh, in preventing heart, heart attacks and strokes. Next slide. And much like in the world, as we've seen, uh, we've seen improvement in blood pressure control leading up to the 2010, 2011 time period using NHANES data, which has two year cycles of data, uh, maxing out blood pressure control at around 53%. But as Andrew said, we've lost some progress here uh, and lost opportunity to maintain that increasing trend, but rather we've fallen. Uh, in the last three cycles of NHANES data to show nationally, we're down below 44% at about 43.7% uh, for blood pressure control in the US. Next slide. So one of the things that has come out um, in terms of a identification of goals is the call to action that was put out last fall by the US Surgeon General in a call to action to control hypertension, which lays out goals and strategies to addressing uh, the, the low control rates. Um, and one of the things we think about is where does our program fit in and how does the AMA able to target and improve blood pressure control? And of the three goals and strategies where we have prioritizing control nationally, uh, utilizing community support and community linkages, the optimizing patient care is really where the AMA fits in or where we see our space in terms of working with physicians who can work directly with patients. Um, and as Andrew's hurdles show, the majority, if only, in fact, only one of those elements that are hurdles uh, is a patient sort of source. Rather, we see that it's really the provider and care teams that can drive improvement. And many of these action steps, these strategies that are outlined on the right-hand side in the call to action are components of the MAP program that I'll talk about in a minute and align very closely uh, with the package that uh, Andrew's described uh, and implementing these provides a way to, I'll, I'll say, create hurdlers uh, to get over those barriers that exist. And sort of item by item, just quickly, we see there's standardized protocols for patient care, uh, referring patients to lifestyle change, uh, prescribing in a way that's cost-effective, reducing burdens for patients, using self-monitored blood pressure devices, um, which Dr. Raycox will talk quite a bit about uh, as a key element uh, in our work, particularly during COVID. Uh, and finally, using data-driven uh, information back to the providers in the form of registries and dashboard and metrics that track performance uh, and track improvement. Next slide. The AMA has set a goal in, for 2026 
to reach 5 million hypertensive patients and reduce their systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters or to reach goal of control in their blood pressure. And what we see is that for a two and a half million patient population where we can reach that goal, we can expect a 20% reduction in cardiovascular risk. And hence we see a significant reduction in adverse events in terms of AMI, heart attack hospitalizations and hospitalizations due to stroke, as well as mortality from those events in terms of heart attack deaths and stroke deaths. In terms of the economic impact, the result would be a savings in healthcare spending of about $160 million on an annual basis. So there's not only significant health outcomes improvement that can arise from improving blood pressure control, but there's also significant economic savings that can be allocated to other sources or other, other uses in terms of the healthcare system, delivery system. In our right-hand side, we see the sort of relationship between uh, the numbers of lives that can be touched. And again, uh, the reduction in systolic blood pressure and the reduction in, in cardiovascular risk. Next slide. So how do we get to goal? How do we improve blood pressure control? Um, the AMA has developed what we call the MAP framework, which is very data-driven, metric-driven, which has three components. And again, align very, very well with other elements that we saw Andrew present in terms of how to get to increase blood pressure control. The key to the framework is an accurate blood pressure measurement. Without an accurate measurement, there's diagnostic uncertainty, there's inertia in terms of physicians un, 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 uncertain or uh, viewing blood pressures as being unreliable, and hence, they, they may not react in terms of increasing medication intensification, and hence we have an act rapidly component, which is to treat confirmed uncontrolled blood pressure once we have an accurate blood pressure reading. And finally, partnering with patients that we know adherence is an issue uh, that we can address with, with teaching and teach back methods that allow interaction and training of, and teaching of, of patients around blood pressure control and medication adherence. So these three elements are key to our framework. Next slide. In order to implement that framework, we really need to have the various components in a model or a program that we can implement. And I know this slide is very busy, but in one slide, it really captures the essence of the, the MAP BP quality improvement program, where we have on the left-hand side, sort of the basis of the program in a six month quality improvement. We have practice facilitation that's provided. We have dashboards that, again, based on registries and patient level data that provide metrics back to providers and care teams at the individual level, and then have evidence-based strategies that align with the measuring accurately, acting rapidly and partnering with patients uh, that allow then to providing tools and resources for providers and care teams to get to, again, accurate measurement, to have protocols that allow for rapid, rapid increases in intensification of medication, suggesting and recommending single pill combinations uh, increasing uh, frequent, uh, frequency of visits. And again, using blood pressure self-monitored for uh, patients to get patient engagement and get accurate readings back to providers. And then finally, the metrics on the, in the blue boxes, we have metrics around confirmatory BP readings, metrics that track intensification of medications, and then a change in solid blood pressure as a proxy for adherence we'd expect to see changes in systolic blood pressure after intensification if the medications were prescribed and taken appropriately. And then finally, the outcomes, obviously, blood pressure control is a primary outcome variable. But again, looking at the percentage of patients who reach goal, and again, those changes in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Next slide. In terms of our experience, I'll quickly present some of the 
evidence that we found in terms of implementing our, our, our MAPDP program in what we call wave one and two, and then our current or most recent work in PCORI on a randomized control trial. Next slide. In phase one, we had one family practice saw significant increases in blood pressure control, but realized that that's really not sort of a, a broad-based evaluation. And we then implemented the MAP program in 16 practices in a cohort study of 16,000 hypertensive patients and saw improvement of blood pressure from 64% at baseline at in, to 64% improvement at six months with sustained blood pressure control of 73.6% of after 12 months. One of the challenges of implementing quality improvement programs is that sustainability may not always occur after that, that program is implemented per se. Uh, oftentimes improvement falls off, but we see sustainability uh, with the MAP program in this, this uh, evaluation with 16,000 patients. We did see some improvement in a reduction in inertia, uh, statistically significant for 52 to 49 and a half percent, but probably not clinically significant in terms of that range. These, these practices had already had uh, quite a bit of uh, information about improving inertia. So uh, having a baseline of starting at 49% is actually pretty high in terms of 50% of the time they actually intensified medication when appropriate. Uh, relative to some national numbers that are somewhere in the teens, uh, 15 to 20% of, in, of intensification. And finally, we did see a, a, in, a decrease, excuse me, in systolic blood pressure after intensification, suggesting there was an improvement in adherence. Next slide, please. To, to test the model, evaluate the MAP program, <clears throat> excuse me, even further, we partnered with uh, University of California, San Francisco in a PCORnet um, trial where we implemented the MAP program with two versions, a full support, which is close to what we've done in the previous wave one and wave two applications versus a self-guided version where there's really just information and tools provided, but no facilitation. So the full support includes facilitation uh, practice facilitation at the site level, and looking to compare then those two versions of MAP to a usual care where there's no tools and no resources available. Um, this was a randomized control trial. We're writing up the results right now, uh, and hopefully that'll be uh, made public in terms of the results there. Next slide. So where are we at today? Well, what we see is that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, this is really a lesson that we sort of expected, but also realized uh, what needs to be done. And measuring accurately is the key to improving blood pressure control and increasing treatment intensification still is a challenge. Uh, we know it's one of the main drivers of uh, failure to meet blood pressure control levels. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Raycox to talk about sort of where we are today, where we're going to move, how we're going to move forward with our program. Mike, next slide. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, th thanks so much, Greg. And I'll continue um, from Greg taking us from where we've been to where we are, uh, have been working recently, and where we're headed. I'll spend a few minutes reviewing the importance of data, metrics, and reporting and how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted how we support program implementation. Next slide. So in, in 2019, our team supported implementing MAPBP in 22 states with more than 750,000 participants with hypertension going through the program. And we'd, we'd hope that healthcare organizations could build the MAPBP metrics that, that, that Greg mentioned in the logic model within their EHRs or population health management systems with our team uh, simply providing technical guidance. But that turned out to be a much bigger challenge than we anticipated. And the healthcare organizations, for many reasons, had trouble building the metrics in their systems. Um, because we didn't, and the organizations didn't have access to the map metrics and reports and what they could share with us, we were limited in our ability to track the impact of the process changes that we coach for um, and uh, implement. 
And when we did have the metrics, as Greg just mentioned, we continue to struggle. We, we did really well with measuring accurately, but we continue to struggle with treatment intensification, which we know is a critical factor for improving blood pressure control, not only in the United States, but around the world. Next slide. So in an effort to have a greater impact on blood pressure control, we changed some of the MAP metric specifications. And specifically for therapeutic intensity, we had previously been tracking the addition of a medication class and dosage changes, but because that wasn't as effective as we'd hoped, we modified it to start tracking the average number of medication classes used per person for patients with hypertension. And we added an additional metric, visit follow-up, which is the percentage of follow-up visits occurring within 30 days for people having a visit with uncontrolled high blood pressure. Next slide. So next, in an effort um, to try to have the, more, the metrics more widely available, we acquired a software development team experienced in building metrics and reports and creating dashboards to display them. The MAPBP dashboard development services that we offer at the AMA now are no cost to the healthcare organizations that we work with. And by using the dashboards, they enable care teams to more easily identify gaps in care target them with the recommended interventions that we're presenting and sustain uh, gains uh, that they achieve. Metric reports can be stratified by race, ethnicity, age, sex, and comorbid conditions. And having all of these data accessible to all clinics in a health system helps promote collaboration so that you might see uh, between clinic sites, high performing sites communicating with lower performing sites um, to try to offer insights and help the whole system improve. Next slide. Uh, to further expand our reach, you know, you heard earlier that we're, we, we have an initiative with the American Heart Association called Target BP, which is a national initiative that, that we formed uh, in response to the high prevalence of blood pressure control to try to find another way to move the needle um, in the right direction for blood pressure control. And there's three steps that organizations can take when they, when they sign up to participate in Target BP. One is to prioritize blood pressure control across their organization. Two is to use the tools and resources to take steps to improve, including the MAP-BP program. And three is to participate in a national blood pressure control recognition program. And as on the right-hand side of the slide, as part of the initiative, the AMA and AHA are piloting a new ambulatory registry that includes the MAP metrics and several other cardiovascular disease risk factor conditions. Um, and, and this includes MAP-BP implementation support from the AMA. We're hoping to start piloting um, within the next uh, three to six months. Next slide. So to this point, you know, we've been talking about events prior to the winter of 2020 when COVID-19 hit. And this obviously had tremendous impact on healthcare delivery in the United States as it did around the world. Um, I, I wanna just briefly review this study um, that looked at the impact on assessment of blood pressure and primary care visits, looking at April, May, and June of 2020 during that first part of the pandemic, looking back, comparing it with April, May, and June from 2018 and 2019 for the number of primary care office visits and frequent, frequency of blood pressure uh, assessment. And as you would expect, the number of primary care office-based visits decreased by 50% in that quarter compared to the two previous years. Um, and in those office-based primary care visits, blood pressure was assessed about 70% of the time. Now, also, as, as, as you, I'm sure you've heard, telemedicine visits increased dramatically up from about 1% of all visits in primary care to a 30-fold increase to about 35.3% of all visits. Um, that was about 35 million more telemedicine visits than in the previous two years during that same time. But unfortunately, and here's really one of the biggest problems, blood pressure was only assessed in less than 10% of those telemedicine visits. So in the United States, like many parts of the world, we were unprepared for the shift from providing care in person to delivering it virtually, especially for managing hypertension. Next slide. So you know, in spite of all of this evidence you see here on the left from a 160-page guideline for hypertension in the United States from 2017, 
Um, primary care physicians remain largely unfamiliar with how to use home blood pressure monitoring or what we call self-measured blood pressure monitoring in clinical practice. So in response, in the early um, phase of the pandemic, we quickly created a very brief clinically useful educational resource for providers and care teams to use to learn how to remotely manage patients with hypertension, something that we call the seven step quick guide for self-measured blood pressure or SMBP. Next slide. And you know, of course the COVID-19 pandemic also impacted how we implemented and supported the MAPBP program. Now we were thrilled that there was so much interest in continuing working on blood pressure control during the pandemic. We, we weren't sure if we were gonna have any work to do at all, but the, the big shift for us, and again, for obvious reasons was, was pre-pandemic, our work was largely in person for many of the planning aspects workflow assessments, we actually would go on site to health systems and look and evaluate uh, ourselves the types of blood pressure measurement equipment that they were using, the positioning and, and, and patient um, experience going through those settings. Um, we did all of that in person. We launched our programs in person, did didactic training, um, lectures and training. And, and, and in the clinical setting, a majority of blood pressures obtained were from in clinic and we coached to that with some self-measured blood pressure, out of office blood pressures being optional, but, 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 but promoted. During the pandemic, everything converted to virtual after a brief um, complete pause, um, we created assessments uh, and surveys to take the place of our in-person uh, assessments. Um, and, and sites immediately started using a combination of in-clinic and out of office measurements. Where we'll be post-pandemic, you know, we'll, we'll likely never go back to exclusively um, doing in-person evaluations and seeing a majority of office-only blood pressures, but we anticipate, we don't know what will happen for sure, but we anticipate that there'll be some hybrid of the two as we move forward. Next slide. So, and I want to talk about where we're heading um, in the last few minutes, um, you know, in the future. Next slide. So, Greg showed this slide earlier uh, focusing on the number of cardiovascular events um, that could be prevented with improved blood pressure control, but we also recognize the importance of controlling the other cardiovascular disease risk factors. Next slide. So to have a more complete cardiovascular disease prevention strategy, we're starting by adding cholesterol, diabetes, and prediabetes to MAP-BP. And these additional CBD risk factor programs will leverage the same three-part MAP framework that Greg talked about, measure accurately, act rapidly, and partner with patients. And each will have a similar logic model and be implemented over a six-month period of time using the evidence-based strategies and action steps, MAP metrics, and MAP dashboards and reports whenever possible. Next slide. And because we have this audacious goal that Greg mentioned of moving 5 million people to goal blood pressure or a, a drop of 10 millimeters of systolic blood pressure within the next five years, we, we, we modeled and estimated that we'll need to reach 30 million people in the United States with a diagnosis of hypertension. And with a relatively small team dedicated to this in Chicago and South Carolina, this won't be possible if we continue to provide the current level of support that we do even virtually uh, to implement MAP-BP successfully. And this is why we're developing and testing what we call MAP on demand. Next slide. So what is MAP on demand? Well, we're building a digital version of MAP-BP that will enable us to test different levels of support, trying to determine how much support will be needed for different types of healthcare organizations to be successful. This is an exclusively online program um, that we can communicate with uh, uh, people at the health systems participating electronically, uh, potentially have a few phone calls, but it will be a lighter touch uh, support model and it will be variable. Um, we, we hope that this, you know, this has to be very engaging to be successful. We know that we need to maintain the principles of MAP-BP uh, in order to result in lowering blood pressures and improving blood pressure control rates. We've already um, are in the process of building version one and we're moving to testing um, later this summer. So hopefully this will enable us to reach more people potentially um, even beyond the United States if all goes well um, to try to reach our goal of impacting um, 5 million people getting them to goal or significant improvement in blood pressure. 
And, and, and finally, on the next slide, um, you know, I, I think it's really important to talk about our collaborations that we've had that, that have really helped us so far in this work. We've been working for many years with the American Heart Association, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, the Million Hearts Initiative, and the National Association of Community Health Centers. We need to continue to recruit large multi-state healthcare organizations and networks of community health centers and primary care associations in order to be successful. And we also need to expand and create new collaborations with EHR and population health platform vendors. Next slide. So thanks for listening and we're looking forward to your questions. I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm sorry, thank you, Mike and Greg. And um, I think we're going to, please please feel free, as Lindsay said at the beginning, um, there is a Q&A um, place where you can place your questions and we're gonna keep going with our presentations, but please start to type in your questions so um, we, we can uh, feel them during the Q&A part of the webinar. So um, we're going to, um, shift the focus to the community level. Um, and everything you heard about is this very, uh, very robust program, the, the MAP um, and Target BP programs that are focused um, in, the, you know, in the clinical arena, um, you know, treating patients in the clinical setting. And um, we, we also invited Dr. Benga Ogadegbe, who's a, a, a distinguished professor and, and global leader in hypertension um, based at New York, New York University. Um, to, to add a dimension to this uh, discussion of Vanguard hypertension control programs in the United States by talking about the community component delivering, um, as we talked about um, in the five components of the Hearts Technical Package, this is sort of in the uh, uh, patient-centered part of things, uh, delivering care uh, in, in the places where people are spending more of their time um, than, than in the um, formal healthcare system in the clinic. So our third and final guest is Dr. Ogadegbe. Um, he is the Adolph and uh, Margaret Berger Professor of Population Health and Director of the Institute for Excellence in Health Equity at the New York University School of Medicine. He is a leading expert on health disparities research whose work focuses on the implementation of evidence-based interventions for cardiovascular risk reduction in minority populations. And I want to also make a connection between the, the, the global focus of, of links and the uh, US focus of this specific webinar. And uh, Dr. Ogadegbe really bridges between his work um, in um, particularly in Ghana where he's, uh, uh, he's completed a very um, compelling um, groundbreaking trial of task sharing um, with nurses in, in primary health care settings to control hypertension in, in, uh, in Ghana, um, as well as his work in the U.S., which he'll probably highlight during his talk. So he's really been a force um, both in the United States and in other countries, um, including some of the countries where um, a lot of LINCS members are working. So um, I'm handing it over to Dr. Ogadegbe. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. And I really, it's nice to be on the same podium with um, Dr. Rakos and Dr. Wozniak. I'm excited to be here. And I'm, go I'm gonna do something I typically don't do. I normally have slides, but I figure that I'll try and do this in, in the form of a discussion rather than just having slides. Um, because I don't know that I can come up with any more meaningful slides than the one from Andrew, Lindsay, um, Greg and, and, and Michael. So let me, let me highlight a few things. Um, first, I think is important. Um, with respect to the barriers to, to healthcare, we heard about the importance of team-based model. We heard about the importance of blood pressure measurement. We heard about the importance of practice facilitation, um, which is really at the crux of what AMA is doing with all of the partners that they're working with. I think it's important to actually um, take a different look um, at how we should be viewing the community. So if you look at the, uh, the determinants of, of health outcomes 
in, in any given individual, um, they're largely driven by what we call the social determinants of health. And, and this is defined by the World Health Organization as the conditions in which people grow, live, work, play, worship, and age. So in other words, you know, where you live matters and how you live matters. And the second thing to appreciate, I think um, Greg talked about this, was the idea that we've got to take a population health approach to how we look at health. And from this perspective, if you look at these social determinants of health, which are often categorized around really access to healthcare and the quality of healthcare that you receive, you've heard a lot of talk about that. Uh, that only explains about 10% of the variance of your health. The other 80% is actually explained um, by the socioeconomic factors, by health behaviors, by the physical environment um, in which people actually either engage in care or live. So these are the factors that are often not, not addressed um, when we talk about hypertension. I'll give you one more data point. If you look at people who, who receive care in the community-based setting, 68 or so percent of them receive those care in small independent practices. So these are practices um, that have less than five um, healthcare providers, uh, say maybe less than five docs. And we know what works when it comes to hypertension control. We know the programs that can lead to impactful control of hypertension. What we don't see enough is the translation of these into practice. And these small practices, or people will call them the neighborhood uh, practices, they just don't have the resources to actually implement this. In my mind, beyond those, addressing social determinants truly matter. And to me, it is the key thing that can allow us to actually begin to actually chip away at how we can finally break through our 50 to 60% hypertension control rate, which by the way is also coming down. So what are these social determinants we're talking about? Think about it. You have a patient um, who lives in a community where, you know, by the time you get to a clinic, it takes you about two to three buses to get there. So transportation becomes an issue. You live in an environment where your doctor or your nurse or your healthcare provider is doing a fabulous job, but then you must maintain lifestyle factors. You must actually engage in lifestyle behaviors where you improve your diet, increase your physical activity, and you manage stress level apart from taking your medications. All of those behaviors require you to be in an environment where you have the option to do that. A colleague of mine often says, we cannot tell patients to have options for lifestyle behaviors when there aren't any options to make because the environment where they live, they just don't have access to that kind of, um, to that kind of option. So you have a patient who have low health literacy. It really doesn't matter how much work we do in telling them to take their medication. We've got to give them the ability to navigate the healthcare system. These barriers matter. Those are the issues that people deal with in the community. So we believe strongly, and we've done some studies in this regard, that we've got to figure out a strategy that allows us to take the healthcare to where people worship, which will be for the Black communities, it will be the faith based settings. Sometimes for Black men, it's in the barber shops. And we've done studies that have shown that lifestyle intervention can actually improve blood pressure control and lead to significant reduction of blood pressure in faith-based settings. And a colleague of mine, Dr. Joseph Ravinal, is doing similar studies in barber shops. And Andrew, Dr. Moran, actually um, evaluated the cost effectiveness of a barber shop pharmacist-based model. Um, where they had a fabulous study that led to significant reduction in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure in barbershops in Los Angeles. So we know these programs work. 
the key issue then becomes, what do we need to do to facilitate their integration into the healthcare system? This is what we call the community clinic linkage model. So it's not enough to have a practice that actually implements evidence-based strategies. It's more so important to make sure that when you implement those strategies, you're linking that patient to the community resources and you're addressing the community level barriers that those patients have. Poor transportation, low health literacy, navigating the healthcare system, addressing issues of food deserts, and leveraging community resources to address lifestyle behaviors. At NYU Langone Health, we're actually toying with, a, with this model whereby we have a study that's ongoing. We're looking at our entire faculty group practice, which are all actually across the city. And then we say, what if we take patients whose blood pressure is uncontrolled, and then we attach to that clinic a community health worker. In this model, the community health worker is integrated into the clinical care team to address the issues that patients often face at the community level. With this strategy, the idea really is to begin to think about care coordination that integrates this community health worker into the fold of the team. Again, it goes to a team-based care. And the hope is that, you know, we give the patients some blood pressure monitor, we gather their data. If their BP is not controlled in three months, we trigger the community health worker. The health worker then will begin to work with that patient to address issues that are not just germane to medication adherence, but issues that often make it difficult for that patient to really leverage the resources that they have both in the community and that they have within the system. The bigger question is, how do we incentivize this kind of model? I think that's gonna be the future. It's gonna be crucially important for us not to forget that majority of action when it comes to hypertension control actually happens outside of the healthcare system. We're working with Health First, that is the largest Medicaid managed care um, uh, payer in the state of New York. And we're beginning to help them identify um, zip codes where their patients are. And these zip codes have high neighborhood deprivation index. Um, and we identified those patients, they signed up, but they've not been seen in clinic for over a year. If you begin to think about that, issues that are driving the lack of or under insurance in those patients is actually the so-called community level barriers. And then we trigger the community health workers to then along with care coordinators, begin to help the patients to navigate those barriers within their health system. You're gonna hear more and more of this. Some data is coming out about this in diabetes. Some have been published in the American Journal of Public Health. But I think until we crack that pot, it's gonna be really difficult for us as a society to achieve BP control at a much higher level than we're currently doing. I'll stop there and maybe we can then begin to take questions and, and have a robust conversation um, with Andrew, with Greg, um, and as well as um, um, with Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Obedegbe, and thanks also to Dr. Wozniak and, and Dr. Rakot. Um, we're now uh, opening up the floor to questions from the audience. Again, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen um, in order to type in questions. We can talk forever, but yeah. <laughs> well, I can make a comment while we're waiting for questions to come in. You know, Benga, I really, you know, listening to you talk about um, the importance of community interventions, and you know, we've had great success in the past in the United States with public health initiatives that have seemed to have fallen off quite a bit in, in recent decades. And likely are you know uh, the lifestyle uh, in the United States probably contributing significantly with a rise in, in BMI and a rise in diabetes uh, and treatment resistance. But what I think is very interesting about the barber example specifically, and this speaks to the importance of the linkage between community and and and, and clinical, 
that the first barbershop study that Ron Victor and that that team did really focused as a community intervention alone uh, and didn't have a whole lot of success. And it was, it was when they embedded pharmacists into the community setting, establishing that clinical linkage with a direct line of communication to the health systems or the, the, the provider that those patients were using that they really saw you know, an incredible drop in blood pressure, you know, double digit 20 millimeter mm -hmm. drops in systolic blood pressure that was incredible. And I think it, it really um, speaks to what you talked about with that linkage, it, whether it's community <clears throat> to clinical or clinical to oh, community, that's, it's, yeah. it's really um, absolutely critical. Um, and I just wanna point that out, not that, that, that addressing all of the social determinants and, and aspects um, are critical, but mm -hmm. but what what I often say is it's a shame to see, you know, we we put so much effort towards the community, and as the AMA, we don't want people to finally get access to the care they need, and and the correct intervention is not performed, which is extremely common, unfortunately, when yeah. it comes to hypertension. So yeah. I, I love the idea of you know um, you know just just talking about that linkage, and we we don't often um, you know we just don't see it enough. Yeah, I, I, I'll share some scary data with you. So within this study that I'm talking about, we call it address DP, addressing risk factors for hypertension control in Blacks within our healthcare system. It's a seven year study. We're just finishing the first year now. So Health First asked us to look at the data of all their insured patients within the NYU Langone Health System. And then they asked us to do one more thing, which I felt was kind of, why would they want this? And they turned out they were right. Uh, Susan Bean, who is the medical officer said, why don't you look in your data and take a look at our health force patients, categorize them into patients who are aware of their diagnosis. That means we, we kind of made that up. We looked at data in the past two years. If you've taken three blood pressure readings consecutively and your BP is more than 140.90, then we say that, you know, you have hypertension. Now, if there's no diagnosis of hypertension in your chart, it means you're not aware. And then we took those who are aware, and then we took those with elevated blood pressure using the current ACC AHA guidelines, BP more than 120, but less than 130. And then we then say, what if we look at the neighborhood characteristics, the zip code where those people live, and then we looked at comorbidity, strokes, diabetes, obesity we found something very interesting. People who were not aware were actually twice more likely to be obese and twice more likely to live in a poor neighborhood. Those with elevated BP, twice more likely to be obese and to have diabetes. So even with a diagnosis of diabetes, okay, somebody with BP between 120 and 130 is not having aggressive treatment. So you begin to scratch your head and say, what is going on here? We now said we need to look at the community setting where they come from and begin to appreciate are there other competing priorities that is not being addressed. This is where I believe strongly that, you know, we're gonna to have to be on, on, on target. If we do this right for hypertension, we can easily extend this to other cardiovascular disease risk factors. So in my mind, you know, the clinic is just one way to start, is the hook that we need. The community could be a hook as well, but there's got to be that linkage, however we think about this. And how to get that linkage reimbursed is going to be crucial yes. if we're going to get this to the next level. Health Force has to do this because they get some premium um, what, what, um, um, designation, and they are taking a population health approach because they're paying for the risk at the end of the day. A care coordinator doesn't cost you much. Community health worker, one to 150 patients, shouldn't cost you much, but they can do tremendous benefits. Um, in, in caring for these patients. Anyway, sorry, I, this stuff is just <laughs> something that I think is just important for us to, to, to address properly. Great, yes, no, don't apologize. I think this is really important. We've got some questions coming in, so I'll just uh, start from the top. A uh, question for you, Dr. Ogadegbe. Are there ex other examples of community interventions for hypertension anchored in the faith-based community, similar to the barbershop model that you discussed? Yes, there are actually examples. So we, we ran one of the most organized study. I was between 2009 and 2014. Um, and um, I think we got it published maybe two years later. Um, and 
The study actually asks a simple question. If lifestyle intervention works in clinics, we had shown that lifestyle intervention does work, but people have to come to clinic about every week for 12 weeks. So this study was called the FATE trial. We partnered with the New York City Department of Health and the Ecumenical Council, and they have the protocol for this. What we did was we took about 32 black churches, split them in half. One half got health education every week for 12 weeks on everything but hypertension, except for the first session. The second group got 12 week lifestyle group-based intervention delivered by church members, not us. We just trained them. We call them the faith leaders. And we looked at systolic blood pressure at six months and nine months. What we found was a 14 point difference in systolic BP between both groups. Incredible stuff. Now, the University of Alabama, um, actually, they have in the rural South, they have black churches doing similar work around cancer prevention, um, diabetes, and now they're pivoting to hypertension. So we're beginning to see more studies like this. I have to say though, to Michael's point, what we haven't done is linking that to practice. We looked at people with diagnosis and we assumed that they received care from their docs. We sent out some surveys to the doctors. We didn't get a good return, but we're beginning to think now that what was missing in that is really the clinic community linkage. Sustainability of that work is difficult to know if the churches don't build a health, or what they call a fit, a fit health ministry, it becomes very difficult. But yes, is the linkage that's gonna be very important. Those programs are out there, um, certainly. Excellent, thank you. Um, I believe this is another question for you, but open to the group. Do you think there are specific social determinants of health that we should focus on in order to improve blood pressure control? Absolutely. I think, I think the key social determinant of health really is access to care. Um, so if you think about it, people will not seek care until something emergent happens to them. Um, we're talking about Medicaid managed care patients. They have Medicaid already, but they're underinsured. It's difficult to leave your day job and be coming to clinic every month. So I would argue, um, I, thought, I thought Michael was gonna talk about this, that we've got to begin to think about home blood pressure telemonitoring because we can't be bringing people to clinic. They just don't have the resources to do that. Transportation matters, lifestyle behaviors. How do we train people to engage in healthy eating when there are no resources? So whole food stores are just not there for them to engage in that. It's not just for hypertension, by the way. Same is true for diabetes. And the same will be true for those who have high levels of cholesterol. And I think making sure that there are community resources where people can actually leverage um, these resources will be very, very important. So to me, transportation, but using home BP telemonitoring to take away that transportation issue is gonna be crucial. Helping people to set goals and to manage stress is gonna be crucial. We don't talk about that enough. We're building that into our own programs. And of course, availability of healthy food um, uh, options um, for folks. There are, there are online strategies that can, that can be used to address those. And Dr. Rakos, would you like to jump in and talk about the home? Well, uh, well, well b before I get to a home blood pressure monitor, which I'd, I'd love to talk about, we, you know, we, we could spend a whole hour talking about that. I think I want to say that we, we just published a, a paper in AHA Journal of Hypertension, Greg and I and some of our colleagues looking at why, um, you know, why blood pressure control in the United States is falling. And one of, I think one of the interesting um, uh, findings that we had when we looked at that was that um, overall access to care had, hasn't really changed since, since the decline started in 2014 <laughs> to present, but, um, and Greg can speak to this in much greater detail, um, the, the, the having a usual source of care um, is, is likely a very different story than, than just, you know, having access. This is a two different things. So actually using it, to your point, I think is very important. And I'll, and I'll let Greg jump in there if he wants to um, in, a, in just a minute. But as far as home blood pressure monitoring, and I know there's another question related to this, to telemonitoring, and is this the future? And I do absolutely think that there's, there's going to continue to be a hybrid of in-person and, and virtual care 
using home blood pressure monitoring, we'd like to envision a world where there's no longer a need to come in um, to see healthcare professionals to, to get care for hypertension. But you know, for, for, for some, they don't have the ability to have telemonitoring visits, the technology, the internet access, the data plans on their phones um, to make that as feasible. Um, and, and, and for others, um, it's, it's, it's much more convenient to not have to leave their job to go in and have a doctor's appointment to take a 15 minute break. So I, I think some combination is gonna be necessary but it would be great if there was equal access to the technology, something that we currently don't have. Um, that would be critical. But I do see us um, probably not going back to all of hypertension management being done in the clinic and hopefully more and more being done without the requirement to come in to have blood pressure assessed. Um, but in order to do that, there also needs to be access to accurate and validated home blood pressure devices and technology to communicate that information back to the healthcare system. Again, an area where in the United States and many parts of the world we're falling short. So I think it's gonna be some time um, until that becomes a reality, but it would be great to see. And in the meantime, this hybrid approach lets people who, um, you know, who don't have that technology or would prefer to be seen in person have that choice. And those that can't take time away from their jobs or their families can have that visit if needed. So it would be ideal. And Greg, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what I mentioned about access to care. And I, I just uh, sort of extend that sort of generally. And uh, Andrew, you brought it up in terms of the cascade. I mean, the cascade even goes back further or down further, depending on how you think of it in terms of, you know, having coverage is, is not the same as having access or having access to quality care or having access to usual quality care. I mean, some of the studies, particularly, I mean, you know, using NHANES, which we've you know, done a lot of work and a lot of collaboration, you know, the usual source of care in NHANES is very vague. We're not clear if it's an emergency room or a walk-in clinic or a CVS, that's your usual source, but that may not be very useful for a chronic condition. That may not be very useful for not just hypertension control, but also, again, diabetes and other chronic conditions. So, Again, that cascade sort of flows a long way, uh, you know, downstream and upstream. So it's really looking at that and access and community linkages around transportation is a key to access, uh, as been pointed out. So again, a lot of a lot of places that you need to link <laughs> community information to healthcare system information to payer information. I mean, I, I I love the example where you're working with First Health in New York. Because again, you need to have the payer, the insurer involved in get, engaging, not just providing information, but also engaging in solutions. So let, let, me, let me give you another radical idea. I, I, I actually believe Tom Pickering, um, when we used to be at Columbia, we practiced together as my mentor. This we're talking about 13 years ago. He will see patients, he sees patients, he saw patients on Monday, I saw them on Fridays. And then I'll carry the beeper. Every patient got a home blood pressure monitor. He said, Benga, we have to stop bringing patients to clinic because what do we do with you in clinic? We measure your blood pressure. We either adjust your medication or we think we're dealing with clinical uncertainty. And then we say, go home, see us next week. Not everybody has that luxury. And it was with that mind that we proposed a study four years ago. We're writing it up now as well as our strokes, stroke disparity center. We, we compared home BP telemonitoring versus home BP telemonitoring plus care coordination in patients who have a stroke and their BP is uncontrolled. And this was a one year study. Everybody got the home blood pressure monitor, has a chip on it, blood pressure data goes to some cloud somewhere, but we're also able to integrate that into the EMR so your dog can see the reading. And then the care coordinator's job was to get in touch with the patient. That's the continuity of care right there. And I mean, they can adjust medications. They don't need a doctor, except that if that patient has really difficult to control hypertension, which we set those parameters. And when you look at the data we have um, at 12 months, the care coordination plus home BP telemonitoring led to about 20 points reduction in systolic BP. And these are people with significant comorbidity, they've had stroke already. Home BP telemonitoring alone led to about six to seven points reduction in stoic BP. This is not new. The folks in England have been doing this forever. 
Richard McManus, great colleague, great guy. They have the patient self-titrating. I scratch my head every day. Why do we think our patients deserve any less in the US? What is it that it would take for us to actually begin to infiltrate our healthcare system with this kind of program? I think the COVID pandemic began to unravel that. Yeah, to Michael's point, there are unintended consequences with respect to digital access. But what we found, these patients I'm talking about are people in the South Bronx, in the low zip codes in New York City, eight H and H hospitals. I'm not talking about NYU Langone Health. These were patients within our H and H system. And what we're beginning to see is that the multi-generational household becomes a problem if you have to see your dog. But for hypertension and diabetes, frankly, we're just measuring your glucose and we're measuring your blood pressure. So you can take that in the in the in in any way in the privacy of your cell phone. So I think we've got to be more aggressive in how we think about this. Yeah. Now the reimbursement is a problem. That model yeah. will be key, and the work that that um, Andrew has been doing um, with his colleagues in building this economic model to show us how much we save becomes so much more important in making this case. These are small studies, yeah. 400 patients. We've got to think about this on a much broader scale, I would argue. Yeah, no, we, 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 can, we I, I completely agree with that. And, and, and have, the biggest difference that we see from moving from clinical trial to the real world and on the south side of Chicago or the west side of Chicago where we're working now, getting the devices into the hands of patients is extremely difficult. Getting coverage for that, there has been some expanded Medicaid coverage in the United mm -hmm. States, but it's still a barrier. And I think the key is going to be continued um, uh, looks at the ROI for payers to do this, for health systems to do this. And again, um, you know, Greg just had another publication on the ROI. You know, we, we've been doing this work for several years on using home blood pressure monitoring to diagnose and manage hypertension and titrate medications. I think that's going to be a critical factor in moving from clinical trials that work to across you know, populations that work. How do we disseminate these devices, not only in the United States, but all over the world? And these ROI cases are extremely important. And Greg, mm -hmm. I don't know if you wanna mention anything about that, but I, 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 I get, I'm, I'm a huge fan, as you know, of using remote yeah. monitoring, but we've gotta find a way to make it accessible everywhere. Everybody. We continue to struggle in the United States to, to make that happen. And we're working very hard to try to do that. I mean, the um, connection and the, the ability to get the readings into the EHR is not sort of generalizable outside of a trial or a very, you know, controlled, um, you know, research project. That technology is just not available. And, you know, then you've got that, that challenge. You can get the blood pressure devices, you can get the readings from the, you know, into either the device or into the cloud, but then how does the cloud communicate to the EHR? I mean, that's a significant barrier. And again, as Mike said, the, you know, how do you use that device and those readings in that in the paper we just published on ROI? The real benefit and the ROI comes from the diagnosis and treatment, not from long-term monitoring uh, of patients. It's really that gain in correct diagnosis and you know, keeping patients off medications who are not gun controlled um, in the long run and all the side effects of that and the, the savings of on spending. So um, again, there's, there's, there's a lot of complexities and what's in the real world and what you can do on a broad scale is significantly different and more, there's, there's more hurdles than there are when you have a controlled trial or again, a, a very well-designed research study where fidelity to the protocols are met, you know, in a high degree, it doesn't happen in the real world. That's what we're we're seeing in the real world. It's 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 a very difficult problem of getting that fidelity. I am more optimistic. We have many rivers yeah. to cross, but this is a small river. Yeah, um, yeah we, no, we, but, we have yeah. to push. We have to yeah, push for I, this I, one. I'm an economist, yeah, so I'm trained to be pessimistic somewhat. But no, I totally yeah. agree that the solutions are there. The question is, how do you bring do we, all of these disjointed pieces together, uh, along with the incentivization, which is key? Yeah. 
Yeah, and working on the west side of Chicago, I think some of the additional hurdles that we're facing right now is being still in the pandemic and all of the um, the disruption that's occurred. So we're having even more challenging because of that and hopeful that as things settle down, um, that we'll be able to make more progress um, in safety net clinics in the United States where we're really concentrating our efforts right now in uh, small and rural and urban community health centers. Thanks. Oh, would you like to say something, Andrew? Well, I just wanted to point out there are a couple of, and the panelists can pick this up too, but just um, going back to, you know, this links webinar is usually focused, uh, uh, has a, a global focus. Um, but um, as you can see from, there's one um, question or a comment from uh, um, Larry Sperling from CDC um, about, you know, just that some of these issues um, that we're dealing with in uh, low income, areas of the United States, remote areas, rural areas, of the United States, inner city areas. Um, some of the, some of the uh, lessons learned from the, the global uh, hypertension work really do apply as you, and you can see that. Um, uh, Meg Farrell typed in a question about the use of remote monitoring in low resource settings. And um, this is a good question for our panelists, but, I, but before getting to that, you, you do hear some things that, that resonate a lot uh, across all countries uh, for, for people who are, especially people of working age, they don't have time to, to wait on a long line at the primary health center, um, take time. Maybe they don't have, you know, they're kind of in the informal economy. Um, their, their boss isn't going to give them time off to, to go to the clinic. So um, you, you make it very hard for that person and then let alone uh, many places paying a fee for the visit, paying um, out of pocket for their medicines. These are, these are universal issues and um, barriers, uh, these social, you know, social determinants um, that, that Bengo was talking about earlier. But specifically to home monitoring, I think the next nice question about home monitoring the equation does change a little bit in, in countries where um, community health worker salary um, is, is you know, quite affordable for the health system. And, and there is already um, a lot of these community health workers, they have, they're delivering packages of care related to maternal child health and, and other um, services that they've been trained to deliver in the community. Um, so, so you know, the, the affordability of that cadre of health workers, which would be, you know, Benga says not ex expensive for a, a care coordinator, but in the United States, relatively expensive. Um, yeah. So that might be a, a key difference between, you know, a remote home monitoring program in the U.S. versus monitoring blood pressure by community health workers in, in other countries. So, so um, turn it over to the panel for this question, though. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, well, and I'll just say that, you know, sort of tying almost all of this together, you know, in, in work that, that um, <clears throat> I've been trying to do with a small team in Kerala, India and small villages over the last several years, leveraging ASHA workers or community health workers that already exist in the system, training them to use home blood pressure monitoring devices to go door to door, delivering medications and communicating back to the, the, the sole physician that might take care of 40,000 people in a village, this can be done um, with those community health workers doing a, bu a bulk of the work. And again, they already exist, they have that infrastructure. And I, uh, you know, I, would, I love the idea to Dr. Sperling's point, it would be great to take those lessons learned. And this is while I'm trying to do that in India and make that successful, I can't, I, I try to imagine what that would be like on the west side of Chicago or even in other communities in the United States if it was, if, if it could be tested, um, just to see how effective that could be. If you could have, you know, one provider with potentially maybe a population health management system, for, you know, or a care coordinator, um, uh, but, but somebody going out into the community, uh, measuring blood pressure and potentially other cardiovascular disease risk factors and communicating them back to sort of expand the reach of a, a single provider or a small clinic that Benga mentioned earlier to have uh, an easier time impacting a larger number of, of, of people. So I think that's, uh, there, there are lessons learned that definitely can go both ways around the world. And we need to start learning, I think, from what, what's being done in many cases outside of the United States and applying them here 
um, and, and, and take what we know here and applying it around the world like you're doing, Andrew, with Resolve. Yeah, it's a, that's a great point. We actually, we have two programs now in Nigeria. One is we're working with one, somebody who is actually funded by Resolve, um, Dr. D.K. Oji, where, where, so if you look at HIV care in, in Africa, the infrastructure is incredible. And it has actually staved off the epidemic um, in the past two decades. That infrastructure has embedded in it the whole idea of this tax sharing. And countries have developed policies for non-physicians to manage HIV. Question then becomes, why can't we do similar things, right? We then said, what if we integrate hypertension management within that system? And so we're looking at that now, um, both um, in Lagos State, it's a small state by a lot of people, and then in the in Akwaibom state, that's a state that has the highest rate of HIV in Nigeria, and working with FHI to train the same non-physicians to identify, counsel, treat, and refer um, patients with multiple morbidities to actually to docs. That way, you unclog the system um, where you don't have to have a doctor see everybody, and and I think that's going to be the future. The challenge we're having is that those folks also have other duties. So we're working with the departments of health or the Minister of Health to actually help us think through, how do you actually make sure that the reimbursement of the work they do is circumscribed in a way that allows them to be able to do this? Unfortunately, most of the funding is foreign. And when you rely on the foreign funding, I think Ampati Ba, the poet from Algeria said as well, the hand that gives the text. There's got to be a way to, re, to change the reimbursement model within the countries to be able to afford this without relying on external funding. But in Fogarty, um, uh, Roger Glass will often tell us on the board that we've got to think about reverse innovation. Why can't we take this and apply it here as well? Because um, we have something called the city dashboard. We can tell you the healthcare access in 750 cities across New York City and across, across the country. It is mind boggling to know that you have a lot of places where access to care, they have healthcare deserts. Access to care is a problem within the US itself. Why do we have to wait for folks to show up in the teaching hospitals or academic centers before they receive care? Why can't we leverage similar strategies over here as well? I think we've got to be bold in the US to take these global strategies and reverse them here as well. One of the things that um, we haven't mentioned is there's a whole spectrum of providers. And you know, <laughs> what about nurse practitioners and physician assistants and how do they play a role, uh, particularly uh, nurse practitioners in rural areas or frontier areas in the United States? We've done a, some work on prescribing and we found that the rate the percentage of prescriptions written by NPs and PAs for antihypertension medications has doubled uh, from about six or seven percent to about 14 percent, where they're prescribing typically first line medications. So, you know, they play a role and can play a role for that, that, that population of patients, but again, provide other care as well. Nurse practitioners, increase in employment in nurse practitioners and FQHCs. Uh, and certain states, somewhat depending on scope of work laws, you know, has really expanded. But you know, there's a role there too for that sort of level of provider uh, that maybe you know somewhere in between that you know physician and that community health worker. But again, there's a lot of opportunity because there's a lot of actors in that in that spectrum. Yeah, all of whom could be tapped. Great. Um, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions um, that are in the chat um, uh, from uh, Mr. Sperling. Uh, interested in the panelists' thoughts on the target for target BP, mass BP, et cetera, given the science and data to support a BP goal of 130 over 80. I can very quickly tell you from our experience, you know, leading the clinical work in target BP is, and I was just typing this answer, 
you know, the, the short answer is when we present the science and the evidence in that lower target, um, essentially the health systems will walk away rather than agree to do that because it does not align with the quality and performance measures that they are reporting on. So it's just not, and it's, it's sad to have to say that, but until we can align the quality and performance measures, which are tied to you know, financial gain for the organization, the health systems, they don't necessarily, in primary care, they are not going to consider going to less than 130 over 80, regardless of the science, um, until there are incentives for them to do that. And so we leave it up to them to set the target. That's the only reason that less than 130 over 80, but I, I will say, I think that um, you know, it's certainly something that, that, that we believe in and we promote in Target BP and in our map work. It's just we cannot impose that on a health system who wants to engage in quality improvement. And so I'll stop there given the lack of time, but I'm happy to discuss that further, Dr. Sperling. Um, the, the approach that we took is that if you look at the ACC AHA guidelines, I actually, actually said this when the guidelines was put together. I said, we're not doing a good job with 140.90. Now we're going lower. However, that said, the opportunity here is that between 130, 140, there's clear evidence that lifestyle intervention works. If you don't have comorbidity, nobody will be comfortable giving medications. That's why the evidence. I think that this is a group that we can really begin to be aggressive around lifestyle behaviors. I think if we push that as a as a quality indicator for the health practices, that's something they'll be comfortable with until they have a better time to appreciate what the evidence really is showing. And that's, what, that's, it, that's the tact we're taking with our care coordination. We say, look, hey, you know what, Dr. Rackots, your patient's BP, no comorbidity, is you know, 135. You've got to be aggressive. Why don't you let's yeah. help you think about the lifestyle behaviors to help that patient get it even lower. And it's yeah. a very and interesting thing. I think that's thing. exactly... <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's exactly the reason that the guideline writing committee set 130 over 80 as, as the cutoff for stage one hypertension because mm -hmm. labeling it pre-hypertension wasn't working to motivate lifestyle change. Maybe right. stage one hypertension would. I think that's the, that was the thought there. So I, I, I agree with you that hopefully we could leverage that, but you know, it's, it's oh. not easy. <laughs> Thanks. And there's just one more question that I think we have time to get to from the esteemed Mark Jaffe. Uh, patient self-titration and navigator coordinator medication titration are a challenge with diverse care plans. What is the role of a simple protocol and how do systems simplify the care pathway to enhance titration speed and effectiveness? Oh, that's such a great question. We could spend an hour on that, especially Talking, talking, talking to Mark Jaffe, but I, 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 you know, we are constantly working on simplifying protocols, um, promoting dual combination therapy from the outset, reducing monotherapy for many reasons, which is on the rise. Uh, monotherapy is actually on the rise in spite of a rise in treatment-resistant hypertension. We're going in the wrong direction there, and so, um, you know, th this is something we believe strongly in how to do it and how to get um, uh, others to adopt that strategy seems to be the biggest challenge. We, you know, there are many great protocols out there, but what's it gonna take to change prescribing behavior? And we're actually now studying that. Um, how can we do a better job at ch changing prescribing behavior, physician behavior, provider behavior in general? Because without getting better at that, we're gonna keep bumping into this um, lack of progress. And again, if we can figure this out here, it's potentially something that could be, uh, you know, relayed around the world. And I know Dr. Jaffe is an expert at this, but um, it's been really, really frustrating for us. But we are, I, I would say we are relentless in pursuing simple protocols that, that can be adopted easily and work. Mike, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, going back to my comment about, you know, seeing the increase in prescribing uh, by nurse practitioners, I'm wondering if those systems had a simpler protocol aimed at those providers, and that's why we see some of those increases. Um, again, I, I, we don't know, but uh, it's a question yeah. that we, we, could, we should look at. Well, and, and health systems that have pharmacists prescribing and managing hypertension are doing much better than those that don't have that, but that's another big resource, but it, but it seems to work. Um, and we've just got to figure out a way to have, you know, not rely on physicians only to do the prescribing, 
probably the hardest species to, to, to modify behavior for. Um, and being a primary care physician, I, you know, it's, and, and this is what we do all day, every day. And we're not good at it. Um, we're, we're terrible at it. And um, this is why we're spending so much effort trying to change that behavior, but it's a, it's a really important point. Well, the, just to, to address Mark, by the way, Mark, hello. Great to, <laughs> that you joined today and great to see all the folks who, who joined. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, so the, the question about pay, so if you're not from the US, turn off your audio and you don't have to worry about all these different payers. Um, like the, the, that's, that's, a, that's a thorny question. How do you get all these multiple payers to, to pay for this? Um, working in the other countries where Resolve works are usually just one payer, the, the government. Right, although they're often a private sector um, as well, but um, as you know, Mark, but um, but often we're we're working to convince one payer, the government. Um, but the question, you know, in the U.S., I think move toward value-based reimbursement is is huge, and 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 that you know if that really takes hold, that should help. Um, but then you actually might look actually Benga and Kirsten Bibbins and Mingo and uh, Dhruv Kazi. Mm -hmm published something, I, I see if I can grab it. I don't know if I have time to grab it before the hour ends, but it's in, it's in um, JAMA, Network um, Forum. JAMA, JAMA Network Forum, and it discusses some, some payment models that might work for community-based um, hypertension control. And this includes having a third party um, contractor or, or you know, maybe it's a, a church, you know, a faith-based organization um, uh, or consortium thereof, or, or, or another community-based organization um, that contracts and the various payers pay into that. Um, and then they help them get to their, their hypertension control um, uh, goal that, that the health system gets reimbursed for. So have a look at that, but um, it's a very thorny question, but, but there, there, there probably are ways of solving that problem. And in our final minute, I just want to say a special thank you to our three presenters. I think this was a really engaging uh, conversation, and I think there are many key takeaways. One of which that there are there should needs to be more collaboration and uh, learning across the world. Right, what's happening in the U.S. can inform what happens in other places, and similarly, what happens in low-income countries that we work in with Resolve. Um, can really inform how to work in rural and, you know, lower resource settings um, within the U.S. I think, you know, uh, certainly when we send out this recording, I'll try to include some of the publications that were mentioned in this session. Um, but again, just really wanted to thank everyone for, for your participation, and I can pass it over to panelists for any final thoughts. Well, thank you so much for having us today. It's really been, uh, you know, a privilege to be talking with such an esteemed group of colleagues on on, on so many important topics and the audience um, um, that's here. So we're just grateful to be a part of it and look forward to more communication and engagement um, on these topics. And would love to, you know, feel free to reach out to us anytime. We'd love to to, to talk more. Yeah, I echo thank that. You. Thank you very much for having us and uh, a great conversation. And again, as Mike said, uh, feel free to get in, get in touch. Thank you. All this is a pleasure. Same here. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right. Take Bye. care.